Off the stage here, we're going to ask Brother King if uh, he'll come up and talk with us just a little bit. Brother King, uh, I understand, has been doing a lot of talking since he's been in the United States. He may be getting a little tired. I think it hopes that he will shift those gears and uh, not speak to us in Chinese. He shifts those gears and speaks to us in English, and he speaks very good English. So we'd like to invite Brother King up here. Brother King is going to speak to us on faith and endurance. Brother Harold King. And he's not tired. It's a pleasure to speak to you, brothers. It's a joy to be with you. Way back in Hong Kong, where I am now, we have about 500 of us at our assembly. So to be among so many of you, this is the second time just as many as you are here, it's a joy. What? Uh, happy people we are and so we should be because we are devoted to a very happy God we are the upholders of the true pure worship of Jehovah the great creator of our universe the fountain of life and uh, our sterling quality is faith in Jehovah God and for that reason we are assured of the fulfillment of all his promises and therefore we are happy we're the only people on earth today that have a real hope for the future and for that reason we're happy and we're happy to be able to share that word with others Jehovah God exists and his word is true and we have faith in that word. We believe that that word of God, the Holy Bible, is an inspired work. It was inspired by the almighty invisible power of Jehovah God which we call the Holy Spirit. And by means of this book, we have got to know Jehovah God, not just only his name, but also his fine attributes, his wisdom, his justice, his great love, and his almighty power. And by means of this knowledge of him, we have come to learn why it is that our lives have been so bitter why it is that man dies and why it is that the whole world is so full of violence and distress but by the same word we have the hope of a new and righteous order that our God is to establish under his kingdom on the shoulders of Christ and we've got to know Jesus Christ too. We've got to know that by means of his uh, loving sacrifice a ransom arrangement became possible to lift off our shoulders the sin that we inherited from Adam which takes us to the grave and causes our death. But by means of this ransom we can be purchased from the grave and forgiven the sins from Adam and thereby be in a position to eat of the fruit of the tree of life and live forever and Jehovah has arranged for a paradise of peace, joy and happiness in which we can live forever without fear of sickness, sorrow, suffering and death. All that is on the basis of this word. And our faith in this word 
is essential. This word reveals to us the will of Jehovah God. And uh, as we open our Bible and see what uh, Paul had to say to young Timothy concerning these things, we can read at the first book of Timothy, chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, this is fine and acceptable in the sight of our Savior, God, whose will is that all sorts of men should be saved and come to an accurate knowledge of truth. Yes, that's the will of Jehovah God, that all sorts of men should be saved and come to an accurate knowledge of the truth. Well, that's what we want to do, isn't it? And uh, so do these all kinds of people. They also want that salvation. And they also want the accurate knowledge that will bring it to them. So this word of God is the basis for our faith. And we must study it. We must get familiar with it. Well, this is a book, isn't it? And the Word of God has been printed in this book. It's on paper. And uh, this paper is destructible. And two, it is possible to take it out of our hand and leave us without it. So where should that Word of God be? It should be in a safe place where no one can take it away from you. Obviously, in your heart. That's where it's got to be. And that's why we have to study it. Because the day could come when you don't have it. One day that happened to me. The Bible was taken away from me and I didn't see it for four years and seven months. No Bible. No Bible literature. But I had my Bible. It was in my heart. And therefore it was available. And I could sit down quietly and I could bring back those Bible themes, the promises, the covenants of Jehovah God. Could you do that? I think most of you could because you've been conducting Bible studies, you've been teaching other people, you've been studying it yourself, you've been attending meetings where it's discussed, you've been reading the Watchtower and kindred publications. So, I think you could, but I'm emphasizing the point that that's something we really ought to do. Get that Word of God off those paper pages into our heart. It's safe there and they can't take it away. Now, Romans 10, verses 8 to 11, uh, give us the relationship to the Word of God uh, and faith in that Word. Paul has this to say at Romans 10, verses 8 to 11. He says, But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your own mouth. And, mark you, in your own heart. Yes, that's where it should be. That is the word of faith we are preaching. And that's the word of faith that you preach and I preach. For if you publicly declare that word in your own mouth that Jesus is Lord and exercise faith in your heart that God raised him up from the dead, you will be saved. Now isn't that wonderful? It's the word and faith in that word in your heart that leads to that glorious salvation from total destruction and everlasting death to everlasting life in a real righteous new order under the kingdom of God. So then, any effort made to get that faith there is not to be wasted. Faith, as you know, is a fruitage of the Holy Spirit. 
And a farmer knows if he's trying to grow food, cultivation is essential. And so it is with our faith. We have to cultivate it. We have to make it strong for everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. But how? How can they call on a name in which they have never put faith? They have no faith in that name. Why? How can they call on him who, of whom they have not put faith? And how in turn will they put faith in him of whom they have not heard? So then, what do we need? We need preachers. We can't hear without the preacher to come and tell us about him. And Jehovah's Witnesses are the preachers. The only people going out telling the people who Jehovah is and what he is going to do. No other person in the world is doing that. Only Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, our preaching Work is the work of faith. You wouldn't do it if you didn't believe it was true. If you didn't have faith in it, if you didn't believe, you wouldn't be out there preaching. So then your preaching is proof that you do have faith. And the result pleases Jehovah God. It accomplishes his will. You remember? It is his will that all kinds of men should be saved and come to an accurate knowledge of the truth. And that's just what our responsibility is. So, study takes in knowledge. Knowledge is the foundation for our faith, and under cultivation, it can become a very strong faith that will be immovable in time of stress. Now, with maturity and a strong faith, we will be looking for opportunities to expand our preaching work, to reach more and more of that all kinds of people. And perhaps we may find it is possible for us to reach out into the temporary pioneer work once in a while through the year. And then perhaps for some, they could consider regular pioneer work, or special pioneer work, or missionary work, like we have been able to enjoy. And in this way, take that word to another country and help people who've never had the opportunity to learn about Jehovah, to learn about the truth. Yes, but of course not all persons can do that, it's your personal circumstances that have to be considered, your condition of health and uh, your family responsibilities. But nevertheless, faith, strong faith, will be looking for opportunity. And you younger people, you young ones that have got your future before you, this is the future. This is our future. This is the future that's going to last. This is the future that's going to be here forevermore. So then, why not make that your future? The preaching of the good news of the kingdom and helping others to gain the salvation that you yourself can enjoy. Well, in 1949, that's a long time ago, isn't it? The uh, uh, Gilead... Bible School out at South Lansing graduated its eighth class. It was the first international class from Gilead and uh, at its conclusion two of its students were assigned to China and uh, they set off to Shanghai, China where they were to start their preaching work. When they got there, they looked around to see what was there. There was a small group of Europeans, some German brothers, some uh, what we call white Russians, 
uh, were there that were interested in the truth and were preaching it and having uh, a little get-together once in a while to study the watchtower in English uh, in uh, some little apartment there. But there was not one Chinese that was well, there was one Chinese interested in the truth, but there was not one Chinese uh, brother in that whole of China at that time. Well, we began work, and we began work house to house. And uh, in a little while, we were able to find one here and one there that we were able to interest in the truth and start Bible studies with them and form a little nucleus of believers who accepted the truth and we had our uh, meetings organized and in the course of time we were able to open up the first kingdom hall in China and we were able in this small kingdom hall uh, organize our ministry school as we called it in those days and uh, our meetings watched our study in the Chinese language and we forgot all about the English language and uh, little by little uh, the congregation took on a full Chinese flavor but of course we were working in difficult times we had two years to set that congregation up and get it organized before the communists crossed the Yangtze River and swept down into Shanghai and at that particular time these two missionaries had to decide whether they would stay or go home it was going to be pretty hot well how could we just a, a little tiny congregation uh, got together to put faith and confidence in the uh, word of god and then see their missionaries run away from them <laughs> uh, unquestionable we we just decided we we're going to stay right there with them and share whatever happened so we did and we were glad we did too because even though pressures gradually began to come upon us the very fact that we were there with them and sharing it all with them encouraged them to keep going and under the trials of those early days we continued to grow we were getting 200 coming to the meetings in that little kingdom hall and we had at one particular time 54 dedicated baptized publishers going out into the field and uh, then of course the clouds began to get thicker and one day there were three chinese sisters working house to house in a certain district of shanghai when they were picked up by the police they were taken to the police station and we got to learn about it and uh, we went down to the police station and tried to get the sisters released but we were told that we were foreigners and uh, uh, we were to get out it wasn't our business this was a chinese affair and it would be handled by the chinese government these three women were chinese women and the chinese government would handle their case so there was little that we could do well we thought it might not be very long before they would be released and three days later they were released and then we learned that while they were in that police station many times that an effort was made to get them to sign a paper that they would not preach anymore this uh, message that they were preaching and they refused to sign they continued to maintain their stand they would not sign that they would not do something god had told them to do so the authorities weakened and they made a compromise they asked the sisters to sign a paper that they wouldn't come back to that district anymore preaching the good news of the kingdom or preaching the message they were preaching and the sisters signed they wouldn't come back to that district and that district was quite a small police district uh, in the city there was much more city in which they could preach and they went back home and were soon out in the 
unprohibited section of the city continuing their preaching work. Two of those sisters were mothers of small children. One of them was Sister Nancy Yu. She had four children, one of them only a few months old. And uh, Unfortunately, her husband was a very unfaithful husband. He was interested in other women besides his wife. And when the um, communists came over the border and came down into Shanghai, he thought he was going to, his uh, business and life would be in jeopardy. So he left the country and came down to Hong Kong. He didn't concern himself with his wife and his family but uh, he came down to live in Hong Kong, so Nancy was on her own. Well now, uh, she continued her preaching work, but we cautioned the brothers to be careful and to do incidental witnessing and to not go out in groups and not to go from house to house, but just go a call here and a call there when they could be quite sure they were talking to somebody that would not likely report them. Well, they were doing that. They were witnessing in parks, in transportation vehicles, or when they were out shopping to shopkeepers. We were still doing that, Brother Jones and I. And uh, any opportunity to preach outside, why, we would do it and try to interest the people. The communists allowed us to continue operating our meeting. They didn't put a ban on the organization, but provided we kept our meetings to the Kingdom Hall and nothing outside of it, they would allow us to continue. Well, we did that, but we did do things outside as well, which they didn't know of. But f later on, even the sisters in the park were apprehended Somebody had reported them to the park gatekeeper and he was waiting for them and he told them that he'd turn them over to the police if he found them preaching in that park anymore. So we had to even do our incidental witnessing very carefully. Sister Nancy Ewan had a Bible study and she regularly went to that Bible study uh, each week to conduct the study but one day, while she was at that study, the police broke in and Nancy was arrested again. And this time she was taken off to prison and she was to be there for a long, long time. Uh, at that time, her baby of a few months and her other three children, all tiny ones, uh, were without their mother. The grandmother was there but uh, the grandmother was too elderly and had too much responsibility. She couldn't handle the four children. So finally, they had to be sent to the wayward father down in Hong Kong. They came down to Hong Kong, but we never saw them anymore, nor did Nancy Yoon. Her little four-month-old baby would be now a young woman of 20 years of age. But Nancy's never seen her grow up. Now that's faith. That's faith. Nancy could have come home. She could have come home to her baby if she would sign that paper which they would call a recantation and agree to uh, support the Communist Party's program. Well, she could have come out and come back to her babies, but she wouldn't sign. No, she had faith that Jehovah God would sustain her. And she remembered Job and his endurance, she remembered that he had ten children, and the ten children died overnight in a terrible disaster. And not only that, but all his property was stolen, and he was reduced to poverty. And even beyond that, he was smitten with a disease that brought him to the edge of the grave in great discomfort. And in, on top of that, so-called friends came and accused him of the bad deeds he had done causing all this to happen. And even his own wife turned against him. Sister Ewan remembered all that. And she had strong faith that just as Job had his children back, more beautiful than even before, and all his property and wealth back, Nancy knew that by maintaining her integrity, she would have everlasting life in the new world. But of course, this situation 
brought a great test on the faith of all the other brothers, what would they do? They continued. They still continued coming to the meetings, still continued preaching as and where they could, and uh, kept going. Well now, how could they keep going? Their strong faith in Jehovah God and his promises, and the endurance that that faith would develop. And they had power beyond what was normal. Now that's something you don't know anything about unless you have been in similar circumstances. I know something about it because I never could have endured what I went through without that power beyond which is normal. But when is Jehovah going to give you that power beyond what is normal? Would you need power beyond what is normal to help you with any worry that you might have? Supposing that would happen to me, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't endure it. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they could bear it. Yeah, but you haven't got that power yet. <laughs> Jehovah doesn't give it to you to settle that problem. He gives it to you when you're there, right in the thick of it, the same as he's given it to our brothers in Malawi, who've also lost their children and had to suffer divided families and go to concentration camps and lose all their property, some of them their life. But they too had strong faith and they had that power beyond what was normal to keep them going. So did Nancy Ewan, so do I. So did I. And in this uh, way, we were able to stand. Well, now, our turn came in 1958. That was two years after Sister Yoon got put in prison. And still we hadn't heard anything about her release. One morning at breakfast, our home was invaded by police with guns, and we were arrested at gunpoint and handcuffed. And after seeing our place torn apart and searched from floor to ceiling, we were taken separate cars to prison. And that was the last I saw of Brother Jones for uh, two years. We were put in separate areas and both of us in solitary confinement. Now what now? Well, uh, prayer is the first thing you think of. <laughs> you pray to Jehovah God to help you to give you the courage and the strength to stand firm and more important still, to put the words in your mouth what you're going to say. And then I thought of Jesus' words, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give it to you in that day what you should say, provided of course, and this is important, it's in your heart already. The, the Holy Spirit won't put it there. Now you see what I mean by the uh, importance of transferring that page into your heart and getting it there? Because there Jehovah will answer your prayers by causing scriptures to come up into your mind and encourage you. I remember the first thing that I asked Jehovah God. How long is this going to be, Jehovah? Am I going to be released or have I got to stay here a long time? Because we weren't told. And uh, after time, my mental circuits began to operate and I had a lot of expressions. Jehovah brought out this point that the mind of Jesus is the mind that you should have now who for the joy that was set before him endured the torture stake, despised the shame, and now I had the same joy before me. And at the present moment I had something like a torture stake. So it didn't matter how long I was there, I would one day be released. I was going back to the brothers. I was not going to die in that prison. And uh, that assurance came into me so strong, I knew it was Jehovah answering that prayer. And Jehovah knew that I would have to stay there a little bit longer yet in order to give a proper witness. And, uh, uh, but I would come out, and that prayer was answered, I did come out. I came out in 1963, and I've been back in Hong Kong preaching to the Chinese people for 13 years since then 
in good health and strength that Jehovah's given me back. Now, another evidence that prayer is an important thing, uh, I, it was very necessary for me to observe the memorial each year, as I had been doing since 1932. And it was necessary for me, if possible, to enjoy the Lord's evening meal in the way that uh, the anointed witnesses of Jesus do. So, I had to think about that. Well, when I was uh, in Gilead school, they taught us how to work out the date of the memorial. Because in my solitary confinement, I had no calendar, no books, no papers, nothing at all to tell me the time, to tell me the date or where I was. But. I realized how important to keep a note of the time. So I devised a way where I could keep a count of the days from October the 14th, the day that we were arrested, 1958, each day, each month, and each year. I kept my own type of calendar. Uh, how? Oh, uh, I uh, put dots on the wall at first until I realized I was going to be there much longer and we didn't want dots all over the prison wall. So they let us use our own tunics, our own clothing in, in prison. We didn't have to use a prison uniform. So I hunted through my uh, clothing and cut off seven buttons. And these seven buttons, each button stood for one day of the week. And uh, I put them lined up on one side of the window sill and then moved them over button by button, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so I could see exactly what day of the week it was. And as one week passed by, I took my toilet paper, as they call it, it was some coarse brown paper with straw inside of it. But anyway, I was able to m cut off a strip and roll it into a little roll and with a piece of soap make it stick and uh, kept it on the rail at the top that was the week and with four of these a bigger one made a month so by looking at this homemade calendar i could see that what date it was all the time now what did i got to look for i had to look for the first full moon closest to the spring equinox well, the cell I was in had a window, but so that I couldn't see out of the window and I couldn't see down below, I was on the third floor, uh, they put a louver, a French louver outside with uh, strips across so that you could look up, but you couldn't look down, you couldn't look out. Well, I could see the sky and that's all I wanted to see because the moon is in the sky and I could see the moon come over. Well, I used to watch that moon when I knew that it was springtime, and I knew by my calendar it was the third month, March, and uh, it was either the March moon or the April moon. It must be one of these moons uh, I've got to watch for. So I kept my eyes open, and I saw that it was going to be the April moon that particular year. Well, now I didn't know whether I would detect the fullness of the moon because if you're looking at the full moon, it looks just the same Tuesday as it did Monday and it also looks about the same on Wednesday. <laughs> it's very difficult in those three days to see when the moon was exactly at the full. So I had to pray to Jehovah and tell him that I wanted to observe this memorial with my brothers all over the world. And uh, would he please help me? If this moon, let's say it was Monday, if it was Monday's moon, if it wasn't Monday's moon, if it was not Monday's moon, don't let me see it. And if it was Monday's moon, let me see the moon. <laughs> because there were nights you couldn't see it. Well, that Monday night, 
came and the clouds were thick in the sky. The sky was black and you couldn't see any sign of any moon at all. I took it as that was Jehovah's answer. There was no moon. That was not the night. But what about Tuesday night then? All right. At six o'clock, the sky was clear, not a cloud in the sky. And there was a little brightness over to the left there, which when I followed it over, it was the moon like a great big silver ball lighting up even the reflection of the bars of the cell on the floor of the cell. I knew that was the night. And therefore I prayed to Jehovah and I gave that talk on the memorial that I used to give every memorial time at the Kingdom Hall in Shanghai. I gave it to an invisible audience just like I'm giving it to you now. And And when it happened that uh, there was time to partake of the emblems, of course I didn't have them. But I did have an enamel cup, which they give us for our water, and I had a little enamel plate on which they put our food. And I put them on the floor, because there's no table, <laughs> put them on the floor and set them there and prayed to Jehovah God that he would accept what I was going to do. So at the time, after asking the blessing on the bread, I took from the plate an imaginary piece of bread and partook. And then, after asking the blessing on the wine, I took the empty cup and appeared to drink, and then prayed that Jehovah would accept that as participation. And so in that way, the memorial was observed. But after two years in that prison, they finally decided to bring us to trial, or what they called a trial. And uh, this was um, just an accusation of what we had done and a sentence. That was all there was to it. But after that sentence, they transferred us from this interrogating uh, jail to the city jail and there our conditions were better. We were able to get Red Cross parcels sent in to us from Hong Kong by our brothers. And uh, at that time, uh, they made certain, they relaxed things. They let me buy paper on which I could write. They let me buy pencils, and they let me uh, buy a Chinese dictionary so I could continue studying my Chinese characters. And uh, other privileges. Well, uh, I could see the date of the memorial then by the paper because uh, the new Chinese also have a lunar calendar which is just the same as the Hebrew lunar calendar and it goes by the moon and it always tells you the night of the full moon and it's quite easy to see that from the date on the newspaper that is either March or April full moon that is the closest to the spring equinox on March 21st and thereby I could ascertain the day very accurately. But uh, what about the emblems? <laughs> There's still a problem there. For two years I hadn't been taking them. But one day I saw in my Red Cross parcel there was a tin of Smedley's Red uh, red black uh, Smedley's black currants and these uh, some I, I think you all know what uh, uh, a bunch of black currants looks like uh, well it looks like a bunch of grapes doesn't it <laughs> and the leaves are almost the same well I looked on the label of this tin and there was that bunch of uh, black currants and uh, I thought, well, now, they make wine from grapes, then that, that belongs to the grape family. You can probably make wine from them too, but how? Well, I would try. So I opened up two tins of these uh, black currants and uh, drained out all the syrup, and I put them in my handkerchief and squeezed and squeezed them right out and caught the juice in my drinking cup. And in my Red Cross parcel, I had a, a glass tube with a cork in the top of Horlick's malted milk tablets. <laughs> and uh, I tossed them out into my bag, and I poured this juice into that glass tube, and it came right up to the top, very nearly to the top. 
And I corked it up and put it in the box and thought, well, now, if Jehovah will bless that, that might become wine. I put uh, about three quarters of a spoonful of sugar in to get it working. I had no yeast. All right? Then I realized, well, if it does, it's going to blow up because it will ferment. So I took the cork out and let it ferment, and it did ferment. It all started coming up until there was quite a froth on the top. I thought, well, it's working all right. <laughs> and uh, there was still plenty of time to the memorial. This was early in, this was late in the last year. It's got to go through to the next year. So I watched it, and one day I smelled it. It smelled like sour vinegar. I thought, well, that's what wine is supposed to do at that stage. So I waited a little longer, and then I noticed it started to get clear. All the froth went away, and I held it up to the light, and it was beautiful. It looked just the same as a glass of the memorial wine that we use every time, and it smelled like it too. And so I thought, well, now we've got the wine, but what about the bread? And then uh, I uh, began to think, well, there's no unleavened bread. The bread they give me is leavened bread, so I can't use that. And uh, yet, we get a lot of rice. Now, rice is a grain, the same as wheat is a grain. So if they can make flour from wheat, they could make flour from rice. So it means the substance of rice must be the same as the substance of wheat. So I get cooked rice, and I've got several grains of cooked rice, put them in the palm of my hand, and ground them down until they were a little flat cake, little round flat cake of cooked rice pressed flat. Then I put it up on the top of the bars of the cell for it to dry out. And I left it there, and it really did become a wafer. And I knew that that would serve as the bread. And by that year, I'd been able to write quite a lot of poetry. And I wrote the whole memorial talk in rhyme. And I was able to recite to myself that night the whole memorial talk in rhyme. And uh, in that way, I had uh, prepared myself for the memorial. But this time, when it came to the point of taking the memorial emblems, I had the wine and I had the bread. And uh, I was able to rejoice that that wine and that system for the bread would do me for the next three memorials uh, that I was in prison. And it did. And when I came out, of course, I still had got some of that wine left. So I took it to Brooklyn with me. And when I met Brother Noor and Brother Franz, I showed it to them and told them the story. Brother Noor, he smelled it. He said, that smells just like wine too. And Brother Franz, he smelled it. And then he reached for a wine glass, he filled it up, and he drank the remainder of that wine so. <laughs> So we can see that Jehovah does listen to your prayer, if it's a prayer of faith. And if your faith is strong enough to rely upon him and go his way, it goes on. Now another experience I think you will enjoy. I was without my Bible, as I told you, for all the time I was in there. They never would give me a Bible. I used to think sometimes, what would I do? if I didn't have the Bible. If I, if I could lay my hands on a Bible, what would I do? What would be the first scripture that I would look for? I didn't know. And I thought, well, I don't know. I think the Sermon on the Mount is a very encouraging section because it tells us that if we will seek first the kingdom and God's righteousness, why, all the things we need to live on will be provided. And I was conscious of the fact Jehovah had all his years provided all my needs. And uh, I'd been able to give my attention to his kingdom interest. Yes, I would like to look through the Sermon on the Mount very much. Anyway, <laughs> that's wishful thinking. I haven't got a Bible. I'm not likely to get one while I'm in here. And so, 
I, in my second prison, in the state prison, I was also in solitary confinement, isolated from everybody else. The Chinese prisoners were down that end of the block, and my cell had each side of it three or four cells that were filled with prison stores, things that they used to have in the old KMT days, which they didn't use in these days. And the cell right next to me was full of books, right from top to bottom. And uh, they decided they were going to whitewash these cells. And their system of whitewashing was to take all the stuff out the left-hand cell and whitewash that cell, and then put you in that cell and whitewash your cell and then put you back in your cell and the stuff back in that cell. They did that to me, and then they got all these books out and threw them out into the passage like prisoners would do, you know, if they were doing a chore like that. They weren't worried about them. They tossed them all out as they did, came, and they whitewashed that cell. Well, now, I had a special privilege in prison due to the kindness of the warder of whom I had befriended, and uh, he would let me come out of my cell and sit in the passage outside. Now that passage outside was quite wide and the windows were all down one side. And uh, I was able to have uh, a sewing machine for a table, you know those sewing machine tables where the sewing machine's on top one moment and you can turn it underneath and it makes a table on the top another moment. Well, I had that as my uh, table and uh, every lunchtime and uh, they were only allowed out two hours a day i was allowed out all day long and if i wanted to exercise i could just walk up and down in that one strip in that one area so this day when all the books were out there i went out there too and i went around looking to see what these books were about and to my joy i saw a new testament as they call them in Gok Yu. That means one column was Chinese characters and the other side was English. I thought, well, now there's the Bible. Or at least there's the very bit of it I'd like to look at. <laughs> and uh, yet I couldn't pick it up because it's out there. So I, I took a note where the Bible was and I walked on round and round because I knew that warders get hungry and they have to go for lunch at some time or another. And uh, when they go to lunch, they leave the main hall and go out into a canteen somewhere, but they leave an armed guard on the gate where he couldn't see what was going on down the passage. All the prisoners were locked up, only I was out. <laughs> so I and the Bible were able to come into closer contact. Well, according to my thoughts, I took it to my table and I opened up at the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> and I read through the three chapters there that I particularly wanted to read through. And then I knew the warders would finish their lunch and come back and they mustn't see me with one of those books. So I put the book back exactly where I found it and carried on with my work at my table. And... Uh, then, of course, the afternoon, the books were all tossed back into the uh, cell again after it had been whitewashed, and the doors were all shut up, and that was it. But outside, there was a real mess on the floor, all the loose sleeves out of these books that had uh, been falling around on the floor. Now, could it be that any of those Bible pages fell out? So I went around again and I very, very carefully looked and to my joy there were one page here, one page there and one page over here of the Bible. I could tell it by the double strip of writing, the Cantonese characters and the English by the side, but I couldn't pick them up because the warders were back there again. Then two of the warders went out. There were three. 
leaving the third one, and the third one was very friendly with me. And he sat there at his desk with his head down, he was doing some kind of writing. So I watched him very carefully, and I managed to slip one in my pocket and get round, and I watched him, he was still busy, I got the other one, slipped it in that pocket, and the third one the same way. All right, I got them now. And he couldn't see them, and I could go to my desk later on and see what I had got. And I got back into my cell at night, and locked up in my cell at night, we had a little glowworm of a light outside, uh, whereby we could see, uh, and uh, when everything was quiet, I took out my pages to see what I'd got. Now, you're going to think I tore them out. <laughs> but they were the three pages of the Sermon on the Mount. And to prove it to you, I knew I couldn't keep those three pages because my cell might be searched at any time. And if they found those three pages in my possession, it would be troublesome. But I decided that the warders allowed me to study Chinese, and they knew that I was studying Chinese. So I went back to my desk, and I slowly began copying out those verses of the Sermon on the Mount here in one of the exercise books that they allowed me to use. I started to copy down the English and then on the other side the Chinese characters because they would think that was my Chinese that I was working on. And uh, of course it was, but nevertheless <laughs> they didn't know that the other side was a part of the Bible. So I carried on and I was able to copy those three pages down and it started and when you pray you shall not be as the hypocrites are for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you they have their reward. And it finished with, uh, and when uh, Jesus said unto the centurion, go your way, as you have believed, so be it done unto you. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Now, that whole section of the Bible, I was able to get in those three pages, although there was one here, one there, and one over here, and they all blended together. So, that's how Jehovah cares for his people, and uh, gives them a special blessing in that way. Now, another way to keep your mind on the Bible is by practice sessions, and that's what I was doing. I wanted to keep my preaching work going. So I went from house to house, as you know, in my cell, from corner to corner, corner to corner, corner to corner. Every one of these corners was a house. And I knocked on the wall and I introduced myself and told them what the message was. And I explained our Bible study arrangement to help them get the knowledge of the word. And they... Um, Sometimes responded, and sometimes they didn't. <laughs> but one family did, and we got a Bible study running, and I conducted that Bible study regularly every week, with first the mother, then the children, and finally with the father. And... Uh, uh, also, I was able to explain to an imaginary newspaper reporter why it was that Jehovah's Witnesses uh, are put into prison because of their faith. And in that way, it helped me to review my whole situation and realize what my work was. But when I got in the second prison and I could get paper and a pencil, now I could try another way to keep the Bible themes alive in my mind. I could write 
songs or poetry and sing them. And that would keep me on the Bible themes. So I started work on that. And uh, you've already been singing together song number 10. That was born there in that prison. But I thought I would give you an extract from another one of the songs to just let you see how Jehovah's Spirit works. You might recognize some of these words, but um, these were words that came to my mind and the purpose of giving them to you, brothers, is not to put the emphasis on what I've done, but to give you the idea that you must keep your mind on the scriptures and the themes of the Bible. And this is only one way that it could be done. Uh, Brother Jones had a different way. He tried to recall as many scriptures as he could and write all the scriptures down in the list. But this was my way. Jehovah spoke to Jeremiah when he was young in years. He called a lad to serve his sweet, but this aroused his fears. Why, I'm too young, I'm but a child. Will men give heed to me? Fear not, Jehovah told him. Am not I with thee? Yes, briars and thorns beset your path. Scorpions wait to sting. But think, O oh slave of heaven's God, almighty is your king. Although they fight against you, and perhaps they'll seek to slay, I, your God, am with you, and I'm greater far than they. Although they fight against you with all of Satan's power, they'll not prevail against you, for I shall be your tower. In Jeremiah's service, Jehovah's words proved true. He had his joys of service, and he had his perils too. He knew the bars of prison, and a dungeon filled with mire where Satan's agents put him, hoping he'd expire. But as Jehovah promised and as Jehovah said, Jeremiah was rescued and he always had his bread and he finally had his triumph. Base men did not prevail. He saw his words all come to pass. Jehovah cannot fail. So we today who walk the trail, Jeremiah helped blaze. Prepare to meet some perils as we sing Jehovah's praise. Wrote Paul, that faithful witness to Christians whom he knew, like he and Jeremiah had Jehovah's work to do. These things were all recorded on Jehovah's sacred page to comfort Christian witnesses at every Christian age. So we who have a task to do in Jehovah's name We'll have our joys of service, but there'll also be some pain. Then think right back to Jeremiah. Fear not the devil's might. Jehovah is our champion and victory's in sight. And just one more. Uh, just to show you how the Bible themes are developed in this way. Oh, happy is that man with eyes, your word to comprehend. You, O oh Lord Jehovah, from beginnings know the end. The way you had your word set down by faithful men of old caused dramas in the lives of men your prophecy to unfold. See now, Abraham of old with Isaac by his side, ascending Mount Moriah. His faith is being tried. Jehovah asked of Abraham the life of his only son, a sacrifice to prove his love. Could such an act be done? See now, Abraham of old, up on Mount Moriah, an altar built in order there, and the kindling for the fire. See him bind his Isaac. Prepare the boy to die. We might well ask the question here, Oh, why, Jehovah, why? Abraham, that faithful man whose heart was pure and true, in prophetic symbol, Lord, he represented you. 
the great exalted father who in love for dying man gave his first begotten son to be for us a lamb. Sarah, Abraham's faithful wife who humbly called him Lord, pictured that faithful woman recorded in your word who was to mother the promised seed who would bruise the serpent's head. So Isaac represents that seed whose blood for man was shed. Back to Mount Moriah again, where Abraham, undismayed, was well prepared to slay his son. By you, his hand was stayed. A ram, entrapped in bushes near, replaced the boy and bled. Father received his son again as if raised from the dead. So you, O Lord Jehovah, from the tomb received again your dearest one, that faithful son who vindicates your name, whose flesh and blood was sacrificed, who died that we might live. Oh, what a gift you gave to man, whom now you could forgive. Breathes there a man with a heart of flesh who can learn such truths as these and yet remain unmoved and cold and not fall on his knees and render to his loving God, Jehovah, heaven's king, the love required in Jesus' name to the God that first loved him. So you can see from these... You can see from these expressions, brother, that uh, that's how you've got to keep your mind full of the Bible. Now, if these things are in your mind all day long, then your surroundings doesn't matter at all. And you can endure, and you can stand firm in your faith. Now you can see how important it is for your faith to be strong, well, now you look with me for a moment at Romans 5, verse 3, where we can read these words of the Apostle Paul at uh, verse ch chapter 5, verse 3. And not only that, but let us exult while in tribulations, since we know that tribulation produces endurance and endurance in turn an approved condition and the approved condition in turn hope and the hope does not lead to disappointment because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which was given us so there we have it don't we faith leading to endurance, endurance bringing us into that approved condition or relationship with Jehovah God, and that assuring us of our hope that we'll never be disappointed, but that we shall endure and come through into Jehovah's new and righteous system of things. Those persons who serve Jehovah God because they're afraid that Armageddon's going to come soon and wipe them all out. Or those persons who think, well, look, now 1975 is going to bring a great uh, end to this system of things. I better hurry up and get something done before then. And after that, there's nothing more to do. We can just go on living in the new system. No, brothers, persons with those motivations will never make the great. There's only one thing, only one pure motive for serving Jehovah God, because you love him with all your heart, with all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and you love your neighbor like you do yourself. And therefore, you want to do God's will, which will is that persons of all kinds all around the world in all the countries of the world should be able to take in accurate knowledge concerning Jehovah God and the one he sent forth, Jesus Christ, so that they could get everlasting life and salvation in the new order ahead. So when a person has that kind of love and that kind of determination and strong faith and endurance, 
He doesn't have to worry. He goes straight forward. He doesn't worry about 1975, 1978, 1980, 1990. He goes right on serving because he's not serving to a time schedule. And he will serve Jehovah because he knows that just the other side of the tribulation is an endless life waiting for him in a paradise under the kingdom of God where no wicked men will exist where there's no war suffering sickness nor death but everlasting peace and happiness and then what are these few years we're living through now why a tiny little grain in the sand of the whole Sahara desert and that's what this little bit of time is so it doesn't matter whether you keep on serving, whether you get killed in Jehovah's service, you're still alive in God's sight, you're like Abraham. Jehovah's a God of the living, not of the dead. He's God of Abraham, he's a God of living people. So even his servant dies, he's going to come back through the resurrection. Do you believe that? Do you have faith in that? Is your faith in that strong enough to enable you to go forward, come what may, opposition or not, doing God's will? I'm sure it will. I'm reminded of the first Bible study I ever attended back in 1930. We were studying the book Preparation. Well, at that time the conductor was an elderly brother and he kept on stressing the fact, brothers, we're getting very near the end. We really will have to get busy because there's not much more opportunity left to serve Jehovah. Well, all this was new to me and it was impressed on my mind. And when I got home, my mother said, well, how did that new meeting go? Well, I said, mother, I've learned something. The end is very close and there's not much left time, much time left to serve Jehovah. And at that time, my sister was pregnant with a little girl that was later born and we were talking about this little newborn baby girl and I said well you haven't got to worry about her education because uh, she's not going to soon or very soon now there'll be a new and righteous world for her to live in and she won't have to worry well that little girl grew up and that little girl got married and that little girl had a daughter of her own and the little daughter has just grown up and got married and she's got a daughter of her own now. And yet, at that time, the time was very, very close. And that was over 40 years ago. But it doesn't make any difference. We still are serving Jehovah. Not for any date, but because Jehovah's will is that we can have the wonderful privilege of being his witnesses and servants, not just for this period of time, not just up to the great tribulation, but for all eternity ahead, we can be his children here on the earth, enjoying everlasting life and blessings. Now, don't shrink back. But we're not the kind that shrink back. We go forward. We try to find ways of expanding our ministry because we have faith. So this faith is the key to our life and we must cultivate it and keep it strong and it will provide us with endurance and the endurance will bring us into an approved relationship with Jehovah God and that will give us a legitimate hope that will never be disappointed because we will live right through into the new system. Well now, uh, I've had several people ask me what happened to Brother Jones and uh, I can tell you that Brother Jones is still faithfully serving Jehovah as a, an elder in his hometown congregation back in England. He had to stay back there, he, uh, he has an aging mother and father that were dependent upon him and he married and he now has a little five-year-old son. So he's left the full-time service, although he has an opportunity from time to time to join the temporary pioneer work. But he is still faithfully serving Jehovah in his hometown. And then some folks have been asking Sister King what she was doing at the time I was in jail. Well, she was a missionary in India and we were not married. We got married in Hong Kong after I was released. 
So she didn't have all that worry on her shoulders. Well, just in conclusion, I just want to uh, give you the facts and figures of where we are now so that you know what's happening in Hong Kong. Uh, there's not enough time to show you the map and explain it all to you, but I'm just going to uh, give you the April report for the congregations in Hong Kong. There are nine congregations now in Hong Kong, uh, and uh, Sister King and I are assigned to the North Point congregation, which is on the island of Hong Kong. And uh, we have 39 special pioneers and missionaries uh, who averaged 150 hours and 68 return visits, 7.1 studies, and placed 164.7 magazines for the month of April. Regular pioneers, there were 18, and they averaged 104 hours, 48 return visits, and 3.2 studies, and 111 magazines. Temporary pioneers, 158. Now that compares with 333 uh, congregation publishers. That's pretty good ratio, isn't it? 158 of our 333 were temporary pioneers for the month of April. And uh, they averaged 78.3 hours for the month with 27.7 return visits. Each one had 1.5 studies and placed 89.8 magazines. Of the 333 left as congregation publishers, they average 16.9 hours for the month. Now, you just think about that, because the 158 that left them to go into the temporary pioneer work that month were the strongest ones, the ones that had the more time, the more opportunity to preach. And it wasn't easy for them either, because they were part-time workers, and it wasn't, um, it, they had their secular work to see to, and they uh, were not school children on holiday, so what they had to do was to go out on the service work an hour before they went to the factory. And they went on the witness work for two hours after they left the factory. And then, of course, the Sunday all day and uh, attending the meetings and uh, on the service. But in that way, they were able to make their time. Well, now, the 333 were the weaker ones or the ones who didn't have as much opportunity to do the temporary pioneer work. And they averaged 16.9 hours. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and they averaged 6.5 return visits, 0.7 of a study, and placed 23.6 magazines for the month. Our quota for the year, 1976, is 458. Well, we didn't like the look of that figure. We thought that the four and the five were in their wrong places. So we were able to change it to 548 already in the service year. So the total publishers was 548. So that's why I'm sure our Chinese group who were here with us this evening and who sung song number 10 to us, these will be very happy to know that back in uh, Hong Kong, 2,000 and, uh, no, sorry, I'm a little ahead, uh, 1,200 attended the memorial in Hong Kong. And at our recent uh, circuit assembly, 915 attended the circuit assembly. Every time we have a, an assembly now, 40 or so are baptized. We baptized 49 at our last assembly, and five of them 
wanted to go into the temporary pioneer work before they were baptized. But they couldn't because they were not baptized. But they didn't want to miss the month of April because there's four public holidays in that month and it would give them more opportunity to witness. So they arranged a special baptism for that night and got them baptized and then they went into the temporary pioneer work right away. Well, how would they have heard without a preacher? And how would they preach unless they were sent? And therefore, how could they put faith in Jehovah God? Well, that's not only happening in Hong Kong, that's happening all over the world until we've got two million dedicated baptized publishers that you have had a share in bringing into the truth. Well, keep it up and make your faith strong. Put the word of God right in your heart endure and add to your endurance uh, and gain for your endurance Jehovah's divine approval and in that way uh, have a hope that's sure of everlasting life in the new system now at hand. Now we're going to hear some experiences of some of our sisters and brothers that are working here in the Los Angeles area. Who would like to have the first sister step up to the microphone, please? What was your name? My name is Jiang Yi. Okay, would you get a little closer? Thank you. And uh, where were you born? I was born in North China, and I was raised up in Hong Kong. And uh, where did you learn in the U.S.? Well, when I came with my family to the United States, we were living in Washington, D.C. then. Why did you come to L.A.? About five years ago, I and my girlfriend decided to come to Los Angeles together. Hey, now you, uh, when you came, you started guitar lessons. Uh, what happened there? Uh, I was working daytime then, uh, so I used to take some guitar lessons at night. And my guitar teacher, he was um, t uh, studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses at that time. So even though he was new in the truth, but little by little he started witnessing to me. But at first, um, I didn't show any interest. I see. Well, now you were indifferent then toward the uh, news you were hearing. But uh, what changed your attitude, Sister Yi? Um, well, with my teacher, really, he didn't give up. So he kept on talking to me about the Bible. So. Uh, but after a while, um, then what he told me started making sense. But I remember one thing that really changed my attitude was one time he invited me to the Kingdom Hall. So I went and what impressed me most was the people. And I saw that they were quite different from the church that I used to go. Well, then uh, he progressed and came to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, how did you do that? Excuse me? How did you come to a knowledge of the truth? Uh, what did you do when you came to a knowledge of the truth? Well, um, so after I went to the hall, I came back and I really wanted to go to the meeting. And so I located Kingdom Hall close by my home. And I called up, a brother answered the phone. So he came on the same day with his wife to pick me up for the meeting. And also a Bible study was started. I see. So you called up the Kingdom Hall? Uh, yes. I see. Well, now, uh, have you been baptized? Yes, I was baptized last July in the district assembly. And uh, do you have Bible studies? I have two Bible studies so far. I see. Are you satisfied? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm still trying to get more. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Mary. Well, we have another one here that we'd like to talk with. What was your name, sister? My name is Esther T. And uh, where were you born? I am a Chinese, but I was born in the north of Vietnam, so I became a Vietnamese citizen. My family moved from the south of Vietnam to the north of Vietnam in 1954. 
when the communists took over the country. And I was got married in 1964. After that, I moved from South Vietnam to the Laos. I see. Is that where you learned the truth, in Laos? Yes, I learned the truth in Laos. All right, now, uh, explain to us what transpired in Laos that you came to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, one day, uh, one Jehovah Witnesses came by my house and told me about the truth. And she asked me to study the truth with her. At that time, I thought maybe I can uh, improve my English by studying the truth with her. So I agreed to study the Bible with her. She came to study the Bible with me for about two years. In those two years, I made some excuse to stop my study because I didn't feel uh, interesting in the truth at all. But she still come back, told me the truth again and again. One day, she brought one girlfriend to my house and introduced her to me. Her name is Joan Roger. She is a Canadian. Uh, she lived in Hong Kong for nine years, so she can speak Chinese and read Chinese very well. Since she can speak my own language, so she can explain the truth more detailed and more clear for me. So gradually, I became interested in the truth, and I can see the fulfillment of the prophecy in regard of the old system of things. Finally, I make a dedication to become Jesus' disciple, and I was baptized in 1975, January. Uh, you say that... Uh You see, that really what drew you, though, to this sister was that she wanted to learn the English language, didn't you? Yes, at first I want to learn, only want to learn my English, but at last I got to uh, resolve. My English did improve, and I also got the spirit knowledge, too, so I feel very happy now. Well, I think we'll all say your English is very good. It helped you. Thank you. How many languages do you speak, Sister T? I can speak four kinds of language. Well, Sister T, would you give us uh, a little something that's going on in the congregation in Laos? In Laos, the congregation is very small. We only have two elders and ten special pioneer, and five uh, regular pioneer, and 82 uh, publisher by the time that I left Laos. I, I and my family came over to United States in August 1975 as a refugee, as a Vietnamese refugee. Now, if there are any of you brothers and sisters that like to go where the need is great, you can go to Laos. Is your husband in the truth, Sister T? No, my husband is not in the truth. He, he has not believed a single word in the truth at all. And he thinks that I am a foolish woman just wasting my time and my energy to do the preaching work during the weekend. And he tried very hard to stop me, but I know who should I listen to. I always remember the principle in the Bible said we should listen to Jehovah God rather than men. That's why... That's 
why I keep on doing Jehovah's Will every weekend. What about your children? Now I try to help my children to learn the truth also. Thank you, Sister T. Well, we have two sisters we'd like to talk with now. What was your name, sister? My name is Donna Lau. Donna Lau. And uh, what was your name? My name is Eva Lau. Are you fleshly sisters? No, we are just school friends. School friends? Uh-huh. With the same name? Yeah, we have the same last name. All right, but we're going to see how they are sisters. Well, Sister Lau, uh, where were you born? I was born in China. And uh, tell the group a little something about when you were five years old that you told me. Uh, When I was five years old, my family moved to Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, I went to the school that belongs to the Christendom Church. And I was educated by the false religion for about seven years. I see. Well then, uh, when did you come to the United States? In November 1972, my whole family came to the United States as Chinese refugees. At that time, I lost interest about the Bible because I thought what I have learned from the Christendom Church is meaning nothing to me. I see. Well, how did you learn the truth then? A year later, one day, a Mexican sister knocked at my door and she was doing the preaching work. She told me about God's kingdom that I never heard before. It seems very interesting to me, so she gave me the pink book listening to the great teacher, and she wanted to study with me. I see. Well, what about your family, your father? Uh, My father was against it, but the sister knew I would like to study the Bible, so she came back again and again. I see. Well, how did you overcome your father's objection? At last, I got a good excuse. I told my father that I may learn more English if I have a Bible study in English. So, (laughs) finally, he let me study with her for that reason. (laughs) I studied really slow, and I learned little by little. As time going on, I learn more God's will and also improve my English language. What do you think of that strategy? <laughs> well, uh, now, did you just travel on smoothly or was your study stopped? Did you have any problems? Yeah, we stopped for a short period of time because the sister transferred our study to another sister. Well, um, then how was it started again? Uh, Meanwhile, the Chinese group is in Chinatown preaching from door to door, and they find out that I was studying the Bible with the sister. At that time, I thought I would understand more and learn more Bible knowledge if I study in Chinese. So for my own benefit, I decided to change the Bible study in Chinese, and one of the sisters of Chinese school, he studied the true book with me. Now, are you baptized? No, but I almost finished the true book, and I soon know that God's kingdom is the only hope for all mankind. So I decided to baptize this summer in the first Chinese district assembly in San Francisco. Well, do you have any studies? Mm-hmm. I have three Bible study right now. Eva, mm-hmm. where were you born? I was born in Hong Kong. And uh, how long have you been in the U.S.? I've been in the United States almost four years now. And. Uh, 
Now, what, uh, what was your thinking on religion as a whole? What was your thinking on religion? Oh, in Hong Kong, I never attended any religion school and never been to a church before, because at that time, I don't like to believe in religions. I see. Well, then, how did you learn the truth? Uh, when I came to United States, I met Donna in junior high school. At that time, she was studying Bible with a Mexican sister. And sometimes in school, she told me what she learned from the Bible, and I got interested in it. I so see. starting at that time, we were both studying together. I see. Was it hard for you to learn in English? Well, at first it is. Yes. But later on, we transferred the study into Chinese. So I was glad because I could understand more better. All right. Now, are you uh, planning to go from house to house now with the, the Yeah, church? right now I have been going out house to house in China territory. Oh, right now you're going from house to house? Yes. Oh, I see. Well, are you baptized? No, not yet, but I decided to baptize this summer in San Francisco. Do you have studies? Yes, I have one Bible study right now. Thank you, Donna and Eva Lau. Well, we have one other sister we'd like to talk with, just a few minutes. What was your name, sister? My name is Sister Jean Young. Sister Young. What was the circumstances uh, around your life when uh, you started to study the truth? Well, it was during a period of uh, time when I was ill, which lasted me for about two and a half years, and I used that time to study the Bible. Was your progress rather fast? Uh, it was very slow, because being uh, American-born, I have endeavored to cultivate the traditions and culture of my ancestors.